Welcome everyone, my name is Rebecca Birmingham and today's lecture is on skin treatments and remedies. Okay, so we've done our introduction on a number of different skin disorders and now we're going to start looking at some specific treatments and remedies for the skin. And we're going to start first by looking at a lifestyle for skin health. And one of Ayurveda's favorite skin treatments is self-massage with oil, known as Abhyanga. So here is a little uh, description of the power of oil massage. So the body of one who uses oil massage regularly, regularly does not become affected much, even if subjected to accidental injuries or strenuous work. By using oil massage daily, a person is endowed with pleasant touch, trimmed body parts, and becomes strong, charming, and least affected by old age. And this summary is from Charaka Samhita, volume 1, verse 88 to 89. And so I think that that summary really um, gives some insight into the importance of this massage in Ayurveda. It's not simply the same act as applying moisturizer to the skin. This is uh, a tool to promote longevity, to, to promote strength of the body. So daily oil massage, as we've mentioned, strengthens and nourishes the skin and it keeps it soft and supple. The skin is also highly innervated. So oil is absor absorbed through the skin and goes on to nourish the nerves. So this is the reason why performing oil massage or abhyanga is often recommended to reduce anxiety and increase a sense of calm. Oil massage also increases longevity. It decreases the effects of aging on the skin, reduces wrinkles, also keeps the body warm and insulated in the colder months. But what you might notice, and I personally find this uh, with, when I'm working with clients, is that people will say on a hot, humid day that an oil massage is just the last thing that they want to do. And this is because on a hot day when your body is trying to sweat, um, the sweat is trying to escape through the pores in a bit to cool you down. However, if your body is covered in oil, um, it can cover the pores and prevent the sweat from evaporating. So again, on a hot, humid day, if there is a natural aversion to an oil massage, that can be quite typical. So we'll look at uh, Abhyangas by Dosha. So for Vata, Vata types will benefit more than any other type from a daily liberal oil massage. So Vata types don't need to hold back at all. Um, the warm, oily, and heavy qualities of, of oil combat the cold, dry, light, mobile qualities of Vata. So some of the preferred oils for Vata Abhyanga, uh, sesame oil is generally number one. And this is a nourishing and warming for cold, dry skin types. And sesame oil is often known as king of the oils. It's also commonly used as a base for other herbalized oils. Another option is a herbalized vata oil. So these are vata reducing herbs that are concocted in a base of sesame oil. So some herbs that may be included in a vata a blend would be ashwagandha, bala, dashamula, brahmi, and so on. And this uh, formula in the oil massage is very grounding and nourishing and supports dry, cracked, flaky, thin skin and cold skin too. So moving on to pitta abhyanga. Uh, pittas generally want to favor cooling oils to reduce skin inflammation. Um, they tend to have um, oily skin naturally and their pores can become easily clogged. So they can use a lighter coating of oil than vata. One of the standard or most popular oils for uh, Pitta Abhyanga is coconut oil. It's cooling and soothing and Pitta pacifying. It reduces skin inflammation and irritation. 
Uh, and just a side note for all doshas that uh, coconut oil can also be used as a natural alternative to makeup remover or a face cleanser. So for pitta oil, it's usually pitta pacifying herbs in a base of a cooling oil such as coconut or sunflower oil. Some of the herbs included can include manjista, gotu kola, bringaraj and neem. And a pitta oil blend is anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial and cooling. It's usually um, designed for inflammatory skin conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, itchy skin and also sensitive skin. Looking now to kapha dosha and kapha abhyanga. So kaphas tend to require a less frequent oil massage than both vata and pitta. Um, they can use a lighter and warming, more stimulating oil such as mustard and safflower. For a kapha type, dry brushing is generally preferred over oil massage. And this is because dry brushing um, is lighter, more invigorating, and moves stagnant lymph. And we're going to look at dry brushing in just a moment. So some oils that are kapha pacifying include mustard oil. This is a more heating and invigorating oil. It helps stimulate sluggish circulation and warm up the cold, damp kapha type skin. Safflower oil is also warming and stimulating helps reduce sluggish circulation and uh, blood stagnation. And again, it is considered to be a lighter oil than say sesame oil, which is more heavy. For kapha oil, it's kapha pacifying herbs. And this tends to be in a base of sometimes sesame oil, maybe almond, sometimes mustard, or it can be a blend of a number of different oils together. Some herbs included include punarnava, bibitaki, Tulsi and turmeric. And a kapha massage oil is used to stimulate circulation, um, circulate thick blood, congested lymph, and reduce puffy, pale skin. So, moving on from daily oil massage or abhyanga by dosha, we'll now look at a regular skincare routine. So with the skin, it needs to be cleaned daily. So cleansing the skin, particularly on the face, um, twice per day is optimal, but at least once um, per day before bed. Um, whether people choose to wear makeup or not, uh, the face is still in constant contact with our hands, um, and our hands are the biggest carriers of dirt and germs. So a general uh, process to cleanse the skin on the face is a three-step process of cleansing, toning, and moisturizing. So first of all, cleansing is essential to remove the dirt from the skin, and that can be done by gently rubbing with a clean face cloth that's soaked in warm water. So warm water is going to help gently open the pores. Either hot or cold water is a bit too harsh for the skin. Um, after cleaning the face with a warm, damp face cloth, depending again if a person is wearing makeup or not, they can follow with a cleansing cream or foam to remove makeup. Um, and coconut oil is a very effective natural option. The second uh, step of the cleansing uh, process is toning. So after washing and cleansing the face with warm water, the pores are open. And that's important for us to get the dirt out. However, toning um, helps close and tighten the pores after cleansing, so they're not vulnerable to more dirt entering. So some natural options for toning the skin include witch hazel, apple cider vinegar, aloe vera, or even just simply cold water can help tighten the pores. And then the third step is moisturizing. So while toners are important, as we spoke about, to, cl to close the pores to prevent more dirt entering, they're generally quite astringent and can dry out the skin, particularly for a vata type. So for most, it's going to be important to follow with a moisturizer. And again, some natural options include coconut oil or shea butter.
Sticking on the topic of cleansing the skin, what about the rest of the body and what about the use of soap? So it is important to avoid harsh soaps and soaps that are antibacterial as the same way that your gut has a microbiome, your skin has a microbiome too. So it is recommended to use natural soaps only. And we generally recommend uh, you against using soap on the entire body. Um, however, clean the necessary areas such as feet, hands, armpits, and so on. So John says that he, after scrubbing clean in the shower, he uses soap on his hands only. And if and where possible, favor herbal and natural shampoos too. So now we'll look at some general uh, lifestyle tips for skin health. So the skin is sensitive, even though it is a tough protective barrier that keeps us protected from the outside world, it's still very easily irritated and we need to care for it in a few specific ways. So for anyone with itchy or sensitive skin, dressing with natural fibers can be very beneficial as synthetic fibers irritate the skin. Um, also making sure that we protect the skin adequately through season transitions and protecting the skin from the elements. So in winter, uh, skin is exposed to harsh winds and cold, so it's important to keep the skin very moisturized. In the summer, the opposite is true, and the sun or the skin is exposed to the harsh sun. Um, so using SPF daily, um, avoiding the midday sun, usually from 11 to 2 and wearing protective clothing. Drinking enough water is also crucial for skin health. So overall hydration is vital for the elasticity of the skin and to help prevent wrinkles. So for anybody who feels dehydrated, um, adding a pinch of mineral salt and a squeeze of lime to water can help. Overall, for supporting skin health, we also want to support our digestive strength. So when digestion, digestion is strong, uh, we're going to be able to break food down efficiently. And when food is broken down, it's formed into a nutritive juice. In Ayurveda, it's known as ahara rasa. In uh, general Western terms, it's known as chime. So this is the nutrient precursor. The nutritious liquid or pre is the precursor, as I mentioned, of bodily tissues. And this is what goes on to build your plasma and your blood. So the quality of the ahara rasa, or the nutritive juice post-digestion, directly affects the quality of the plasma and the blood. And from what you've learned in the skin assessment lecture, the quality of the skin is in incredibly linked to the quality of the plasma in the blood. Also making sure getting proper sleep. So we've all heard the phrase, get your beauty sleep at one stage or another, but is there really any truth behind it? And does sleep actually affect the skin and appearance? So doing some research, there are actually a number of scientific studies that have proven, in fact, you do need beauty sleep. So one study suggests that chronic poor sleep quality is associated with increased signs of aging, a diminished skin barrier function, and overall lower satisfaction with appearance. Another study says lack of sleep accelerates signs of skin aging and weakens the ability to repair itself at night. So not only um, does uh, lack of sleep cosmetically affect the skin, it actually can diminish the skin barrier function. So sleep is essential not only for beauty, uh, but also for the um, integrity of the skin. In Ayurveda, a lack of sleep aggravates vata, pitta, and the liver. So if a person has a lack of sleep, they may have ruddy, puffy, or dull skin appearance. So sleep is essential to restore and rejuvenate the liver as the liver plays a vital role in cleansing the blood. And as we know, if there's a, a 
an accumulation of metabolic waste or AMA in the blood that can have a significant impact on the health of the skin. The hours before midnight are the most important for rest and rejuvenation and this is why you'll hear over and over again um, in Ayurveda that we recommend going to bed before 10 p.m. So after 10 p.m. there's a second wind of energy that generally lasts until about 1, 1 a.m. And this is the energy that the body needs to restore and rejuvenate, not to spend on a couple of extra hours answering emails or finishing off that presentation. Um, so you may have experienced this yourself. You know, you might be sitting on a couch, it's about 9 or 9.30, you're starting to feel a little bit tired, but you just stay up. You might be on your phone or you might be reading a book or whatever it is. You stay up a little bit later than planned. You then go into bed at maybe 11, 11.30, and all of a sudden you're wide awake and, yeah, you are regretting your decision about not going to bed when your body was telling you to. So when we go through this lack of sleep, and there's a weakness in the liver, we can have then a toxic buildup in the blood which displays on the skin. It's also important to note that lack of sleep aggravates vata, so this can lead to someone being tense and jittery. They can have a grey or dull complexion and experience bags under their eyes. Okay. So we've reviewed um, the lifestyle for skin, and now we'll look at some specific skin treatments. So in Ayurveda, herbal pastes are known as kalka. So a face mask, for example, can be used or made with a variety of different substances. Just one example would be a nice anti-inflammatory face mask would be something like sandalwood powder and rose water combined. A poultice um, is when we apply herbs directly onto the skin. It's usually crushed herbs mixed with a small amount of water. An example would be neem or bringarage. And then this herbal paste or mixture is spread on the skin and covered with gauze or muslin cloth. So there are two ways to apply herbal paste to the skin, one as a face mask and one as a poultice. Another herbal paste is called an uptan. So this is a cleansing skin rub and it is generally made from coarsely ground legumes, then combined with oils and herbs according to the dosha. So the aim is to cleanse and revitalize the skin. However, do be warned that an uptan is also an effective way to clog your pipes and your plumbing. And you may find if you are rinsing it off in the shower that your bathtub starts to turn into a pond. So do be warned in advance. Some typical ingredients um, will include ground mung beans, uh, chickpea flour, also known as bee sand flour, um, turmeric and rose water. And here we have a couple of examples um, of uh, different mixtures that you can experiment with. So these are bases that you can adjust according to your dosha. So in the first example, we have one tablespoon of the sandalwood powder, two tablespoons of chickpea flour. So that's sort of the, the chickpea flour is the cleansing and exfoliating base. We have the sandalwood and turmeric, anti-inflammatory herbs, and rose water to add some liquid to the paste. Then in the second example, chickpea flour, neem powder, coconut oil, and turmeric. So it can also be an oil added to an uptan instead of a, a water or a liquid. So how you make an uptan is you mix all of the dry ingredients in a bowl and add the liquid uh, combine and combine to form a paste. So if, as in the last example, you're choosing to use coconut oil, just melt it in advance so it's um, in a liquid state. You can apply then to the face for 20 minutes and shower and remove with warm water. Looking now at herbal oils. So a couple of different herbal oils that we can use as skin treatments. One is Bringarage oil. So Bringarage oil is often used for reducing itching, rashes, eczema, and other inflammatory conditions. 
Bring Garage Oil is also known to help recolor the skin after depigmentation. And that depigmentation is a characteristic of a skin disorder known as vitiligo. Neem oil is a famous antimicrobial, so it helps kill bacterial and fungal infections on the skin. Uh, it's also anti-inflammatory, helps reduce skin itching and rashes, and is used to relieve conditions such as eczema and psoriasis. It's also used directly on moles, liver spots and warts. Ashwagandha Bala oil is a nourishing formula where both ashwagandha and bala are combined, usually in a base of sesame oil. And this helps strengthen thin, weak skin. Mahanarayan oil is used for troubled muscles primarily. It's a warming aromatic oil that helps soothe tight and painful muscles. And when you apply this oil, you can actually feel it warming your skin in just a couple of seconds. So look out for that if you use that oil. So it's very good for cold vata types. So another way that the skin can become uh, damaged is through stretch marks. And John's wife, Natalie, shares her experience that going through her pregnancy, she felt that she was one of the lucky few that were immune to getting stretch marks throughout her pregnancy. She says that she was very diligent and she applied her homemade stretch mark cream uh, and gratefully remained stretch mark free throughout the pregnancy. However, in the last couple of weeks when the baby was growing uh, most rapidly, she suddenly had all of the typical uh, stretch marks of pregnancy. So she says that trying different homemade creams and ingredients may help prevent stretch marks, but there's also a genetic component. So staying vigilant, especially towards the end of pregnancy, can make a difference in terms of the quantity and severity of stretch marks. So why do stretch marks actually appear? So the skin does have an amazing ability to stretch and adapt. And this is due to collagen and elastin fibers. However, if this collagen and elastin fibers are stretched too far, they will tear. And this is where the scarring of a stretch mark occurs. So common causes of stretch marks include rapid weight gain or weight weight loss and as we spoke about with Natalie's experience pregnancy and in fact up to 90% of women in pregnancy can be affected by stretch marks. So it is important to keep the skin hydrated and focus on areas that are prone to growth during pregnancy such as stomach, hips, thighs and breasts. Some typical um, natural options that people use to prevent stretch marks include the following. So cocoa butter is very popular, used to hydrate the skin and improves skin's elasticity. Olive oil can help heal damaged collagen and increase blood flow to the skin. And aloe vera can help heal scar tissue from stretch marks. But I do just want to add that from medical research and scientific journals, topical methods lack strong evidence, so they may not be fully effective in reducing or preventing stretch marks. And as Natalie mentioned, and we discussed on the previous slide, there can also be quite a strong genetic component. Healthy dietary fats are also important to improve the skin elasticity and may play a role in the prevention of stretch marks. So another uh, type of treatment for the skin is sweat therapy. So in Ayurveda, sweat therapy is known as Svedana. So this detoxifies the blood, which will naturally improve the quality of the skin. It also opens the pores to prevent them from getting clogged. However, sweating may irritate some inflammatory skin conditions, such as eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis. Sweat um, does soften and hydrate the skin to a certain extent. So mild and mo to moderate activity um, stimulates the production of sebum. And sebum is an oily 
fatty substance that moisturizes the skin. However, it's a bit of a catch-22 that you must replace the fluids lost through sweating or else the skin will dry out again. So excess uh, sweating and exercise will, in the long run, dehydrate the skin, but mild to moderate exercise and sweating will increase sebum production and moisturize the skin. So to perform or undergo sweat therapy, there are a number of different options. The first is simply bathing. So you don't always need fancy equipment um, to go through sweat therapy. Um, simply sitting in a tub of hot water will increase your heart rate and stimulate sweating. Um, to enhance the effect, keep the doors and windows closed. Uh, but make sure to have drinking water at hand and don't stay um, in the tub with the doors closed for any longer than comfortable. Another option is to wrap yourself in blankets. This is generally the preferred method over a bath when you're sweating out a fever, for example. And this is because you won't catch a chill when you leave the water. Dry saunas help stimulate circulation. And these are most suited to cathotypes, as cathotypes tend to retain water beneath the skin. However, a dry sauna generally tends to be too drying and aggravating for vata. But a steam sauna may be more appropriate for vata. So this exposes the body to moist heat as opposed to the dry heat that we spoke about on the previous slide. The warmth and moisture are, will be more beneficial for vata as opposed to the dry sauna. There are also a number of types of bodywork treatments in Ayurveda that we use to maintain the health of the skin. Um, number one, as we've already discussed, is massage, known as abhyanga. The next is dry brushing, or garshana. So we've already touched on dry brushing a little bit, but we'll go into it in some more detail now. So dry brushing is invigor has an invigorating and stimulating effect on circulation. Uh, Cathotypes will benefit most from dry brushing and can perform daily. It will stimulate their sluggish blood flow and bring more blood to the surface of the skin and will give the skin a healthier, pinker complexion. It also helps relieve congestion and stagnation and reduces swelling and puffiness. It stimulates the lymphatic system, which assists in the efficient removal of toxins and helps remove dead skin cells. So when there's dead skin cells uh, removed, it makes for easier elimination of toxins through the skin. So for pitta types, uh, as we've mentioned, their skin tends to be a little bit more oily and the pores can become clogged. So dry brushing can help dry out this excess oil quality. However, they may not need to perform as frequently as a cathotype, perhaps just once per week instead of daily, and can follow with a light oil massage with a pitta pacifying oil, such as pitta herbalized oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil. So for vata types, uh, due to their inherent dryness, uh, should not perform dry brushing regularly. Dry brushing is very rough, very dry, very vat aggravating, so they should stick with daily oil massage with sesame oil as a general rule of thumb. So the next uh, bodywork therapy is dry powder massage known as Udvartana. So this is when dry powders are rubbed all over the skin and um, it removes excess oil from the skin and also acts as an exfoliant. Similar to dry brushing, a little bit too drying for vata types, um, most beneficial for kaphas. And it's generally made from a base of ground legumes or grains. So from my experience, um, chickpea flour is um, an effective one to use, also known as bee sand flour. Um, almond flour, it could be made from ground oatmeal, ground rice, ground mung beans, so quite easy to um, uh, access these ingredients from your own kitchen. 
Dry powder massage can also be herbalized according to your dosha. So a couple of typical um, herbalized powders that are used in this treatment include trifila, and I've gone through a full body udvartana with trifila powder, and it's a really wonderful treatment if you get the opportunity. Um, other herbs used are ashwagandha, amalaki, bringaraj, neem, turmeric, and punarnava. So now we've looked through a number of different skin treatments and body works, uh, body work therapies. We'll now look at diet remedies by guna and taste. So we'll start by looking at oily, ojas building and sweet foods. So first of all, this category is going to combat dryness. So they tend to be demulcent in nature and increase the subcutaneous fat beneath the skin. So these foods are going to nourish, moisturize, soften and protect the skin. And these foods also tend to be quite heavy, so they'll help build healthy tissues. The sweet taste also soothes inflammation and is cooling. And a few examples include ghee, coconut oil and avocado. Some contraindications to the oily ojas building sweet category is that oily and sweet taste can aggravate infections. So sweet oily foods tend to, to be heavy and gooey as we've mentioned. They slow circulation, can clog pores and lead to skin breakout. So avoid if prone to oily skin conditions such as acne, blackheads and whiteheads. So hot and pungent uh, stimulates circulation and dilates vessels close to the skin. Anything that's heating or vasodilating uh, will greatly increase blood flow to the surface of the skin. So it also encourages sweating. So some examples include black peppers, jalapenos, mustard seed, and so on. Um, again, some contraindications in excess can cause or aggravate skin inflammation. So looking now to the clear, bitter, sour category. So clear, bitter and sour are gunas and tastes that we generally associate with clearing ama. So cleaning ama is going to be good for the skin. However, the means of clearing ama will depend on the constitution. So it's not a one size fits all model when it comes to cleansing ama. So with vata, it can often be digestive stimulants and mild laxatives to keep the colon clean. For pitta, it can be purgatives and mild digestives. We don't want any strong digestive or very heating digestive stimulants. And for kapha, we want those pungent fiery digestives diaphoretics and diuretics to clear ama. So just an example is uh, bitters are kapha pacifying but vata aggravating. So it's always important to keep the individual in mind when it comes to cleaning ama. These foods tend to cleanse the blood and cleanse the liver. Some examples include beets, kale, blueberries and cranberries reduce skin inflammation, whereas sour moisturizes while bitter dries. So some contraindications is in excess bitter can lead to dryness, and ferments spoil the blood and overheat the liver leading to pimples and acne. So when we look at sour, it's important to remember that there are two different categories of sour. So there are some sour fruits um, like lime, for example, which plays a role in cleansing the blood. But then there are more sharp, pungent ferments and um, say, for example, sauerkraut. And an excess of the ferments is the ones that spoil the blood and overheat the liver. So not all sours are created equal. Looking now to salty. Salt is an antidiuretic, so it will help combat dryness. However, some contraindications and um, in excess it can cause swelling, water retention and puffy skin. 
Salt also dehydrates the cells by reducing osmotic pressure of lymphatic fluids. So just like a stick of celery turns lymph in a bowl of salt or a bowl of water, skin loses its tone when you eat too much salt and it becomes wrinkly. Astringent and dry will tone and tighten the tissue and dry out any fluid accumulation. Cold can provide some temporary relief to itching and rashes, but some contraindications for cold is that cold also slows down circulation and can lead to puffy, pale skin. Moving on now to some herbal remedies by action. So the first herbal action we will discuss is a topical astringent. So the first example of a topical astringent is witch hazel. So we've mentioned witch hazel a little earlier in the lecture and for its use for toning and tightening the pores as a facial cleanser and also in varicose veins. It's generally used externally to tone and tighten the skin. It reduces inflammation, soothes skin irritation and reduces itching. Also has an antimicrobial action to reduce infection and has anti-aging properties. So witch hazel is rich in tannins, which um, provide antioxidants for the skin. Typically used, like we said, as a daily toner, specifically for oily skin. Also in conditions such as acne, psoriasis and eczema. Some more topical astringents include harataki. So internally, harataki cleanses the colon and reduces ama. Externally, uh, its astringent quality acts as a natural toner and tightens the skin. Um, harataki is also uh, rejuvenative to the tissues. Trifila internally clears ama, which again, as we know, is one of the most common cause of skin disorders. Externally, it can be used as dry powder massage. We've talked about that a little bit already today too. Uh, and can also be used to reduce skin inflammation and boils. The next category of herbs by action we'll look at are complexion enhancing herbs or varnia herbs. So it is important to note that any herb can technically be complexion enhancing if it balances the gunas, the doshas, and clears ama. So turmeric is one of Ayurveda's favorite herbs for enhancing the complexion. It's often given to a mother while carrying a baby, so the baby will have beautiful skin, traditionally. And internally, it purifies the blood and clears systemic ama. Externally, it soothes inflammation, also antimicrobial, used in conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, and acne. And I do just include a note about using uh, turmeric externally. While a small amount will give the skin a nice glow and luster, um, excess turmeric will certainly stain the skin yellow. So saffron used internally invigorates the blood and increases circulation to the skin. Externally it can be used as a paste in conditions such as acne and eczema. Amalaki is generally used internally as it dilates capillary beds and increases uh, blood flow in the skin. Licorice is an anti-inflammatory herb and helps combat dryness internally, which in turn emoliates the skin. Externally, it reduces puffy red skin and prevents itching. So sandalwood used internally purifies the blood. Externally, it reduces infection, soothes inflammation and itching, and burning sensations in the skin and is typically used in conditions such as eczema, psoriasis and acne. However, just a note on sandalwood is that it is a slow growing tree and it's becoming endangered, so make sure your sources are sustainable. Looking now at alterative herbs, um, which clean and uh, clear the blood of toxicity, 
First is Mangista. So internally it'll clean and cool the blood. Mangista reduces excess pit of heat and inflammation, removing ama from the blood, and is typically used in conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, and rosacea. Externally, Mangista can be used in a wash or in a cream to enhance the complexion, and is typically used topically and in conditions like dermatitis, itchy skin, and scabies. Caducci internally also cleanses the blood of ama and is particularly useful in skin conditions that are caused by, a, by liver weakness, perhaps due to alcohol, drugs, pharmaceuticals, stress and so on. Arjuna used internally at clears pitta inflammation from the skin. Acne, rosacea, itchy skin and hives are just some of the conditions that it's generally used for. Some other herbs in this category include sandalwood, turmeric, and amalaki, which we've already discussed. Moving on to anti-inflammatory herbs, um, aloe vera uh, can be used both internally and externally. It's cooling and bitter, reducing inflammation in conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, hives, and burns on the skin too. Bringarage can also be used both internally and externally, reducing itching, inflammation, conditions such as ringworm, and also used, as we mentioned um, earlier, to recolor the skin after depigmentation, and this is in a condition known as vitiligo. So Brahmi can also be used internally and externally. Bitter, another bitter cool anti-inflammatory that reduces itchy rashes and skin swelling. And rose is generally uh, used externally. Reduces puffy swellings in the skin. Calms inflammatory outbreaks on the skin. Typical inflammatory skin conditions such as psoriasis, eczema and hives. And is often used as a face wash for clearing acne. Turmeric, which we've already discussed, um, but in, uh, in line with anti-inflammatory, it's well known for this action on the skin. So curcumin is the active ingredient um, in turmeric that gives it its strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect. So topically, it can be used in pastes, face masks, and obtans and often used in conditions like acne, rosacea, eczema, and psoriasis. So moving from anti-inflammatories to antimicrobials, tea tree oil is a powerful antimicrobial and is often the best for skin infections, but another reminder that tea tree oil should never be applied directly to the skin and should be used in a base carrier oil. Uh, Manuka honey is also a powerful antimicrobial and there's been many uh, studies into its efficacy. And so what John adds is that the doctor who delivered his daughter, Francesca, uh, used honey as an antimicrobial while he was doing Doctors Without Borders in Africa. So using Manuka honey as an antimicrobial, the amount of honey used will depend on the size of the wound and how much the wound is seeping. So Manuka honey needs to have at least a 15 UMF, that stands for a unique Manuka factor, for it to be effective. Uh, typically about 20 ml of honey uh, is used on a 10 centimeter square dressing. However, the deeper the infection, the more honey is needed. It's then covered in bandage and the dressing is changed once per day. However, if the dressing sticks to the wound, it's a sign that it probably needs more frequent changing. Another powerful antimicrobial is neem, um, most commonly used again in a carrier oil and applied to the skin, clears skin uh, bacterial and fungal infections, and used in conditions such as ringworm, scabies, and lice. Vedanga is generally taken internally as an alterative and antimicrobial, reducing ama. 
And the juice and leaves of Vodonga can also be used externally to prevent itching and reduce fungal infections of the skin. Looking now at demulsin herbs, uh, the first is Shatavari. So Shatavari is generally taken internally, however it can be used externally on the skin as well in the form of Shatavari ghee. So Shatavari helps prevent collagen breakdown and helps the skin maintain its elasticity. Uh, Shatavari also contains saponins and these uh, help reduce free radicals preventing early aging and wrinkling of the skin. Licorice is generally taken internally as an antidiuretic and emoliates the skin. Diaphoretic herbs increase sweating and circulation by dilating blood vessels close to the skin. Some typical examples include Tulsi, also known as holy basil or holy basil, uh, trichotu, mint, cardamom, saffron, cinnamon, fenugreek, and ginger. You can see some mint and cardamom pods pictured. And a rubefacient. So rubefacient substances make the skin red when applied topically, often through mild irritation of the skin, causing dilation of capillaries. So when applied topically to the skin, um, they reduce pain and invigorate circulation to the area. So some examples of everyday rubefacian herbs include cayenne pepper, mustard seed, cinnamon, garlic, and castor oil. And finally, looking at vulnerary herbs. So these are herbs that heal wounds and are generally used externally, such as aloe vera. So this is again one of Ayurveda's top herbs for healing wounds. And um, the gel in aloe vera is rich in polysaccharides, which heal the skin and the membranes of the skin. Commonly used for burns, scars, stretch marks. And some other herbs in this category include Arjuna, turmeric, and mangista. So that takes us to the end of today's lecture. Thank you all for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoyed learning about skin treatments. Thank you.